Good morning, year nine. Uh, we are on to our second live lesson all about poetry today. So last week we looked at some contemporary poetry. Um, so we are slowly going back in time. Uh, we're going to jump backwards a hundred years now and look at um, the poetry of World War One. Now I'm sure a lot of you have already done quite a bit of um, work at primary school probably as well as at secondary school about what life was like for soldiers fighting in World War One. Um, obviously we remember them every November on Armistice Sunday. Um, so we're going to have a look at one of Wilfred Owen's poems today. Um, probably one of the most famous poems, uh, poets writing in World War One. So, hi, <laughs> hello. So who exactly was Wilfred Owen? Um, okay, he was a soldier. Um, he was born in 1893, I think. You can check that. Um, so when he went off to fight in 1914, um, he was only just 21, I think, if my maths is, is correct. Um, and when he was fighting, he was wounded in combat and diagnosed with shell shock. And that is what the poem that we're going to read today is all about. So I'll tell you a bit about what shell shock is um, in a bit, a bit later. So he was evacuated to hospital. He left the battlefield was sent to hospital and then when he was uh, when it was decided that he was better he was sent back to France to continue fighting in the war. Um, he is one of the most admired poets of World War I, um, probably Anthem for Doomed Youth is one that you've heard of and possibly Dulce A Decorum Est. Uh, if you would like to read those poems I've attached a PDF of this PowerPoint on Show My Homework and if you click on these, on the PDF, uh, they should take you straight to the links but they are very well known poems, you'll be able to find them on uh, any quick Google search, you'll find them. Um, <coughs> um, he was a bit different to a lot of other poets writing during World War One. His poetry often graphically depicted, so very strong images of the horrors of warfare, um, the physical landscape, a lot of the time, you know, being in the trenches, being exposed to the wind and the rain and the snow, um, also the human body in relation to those landscapes. So lots of talking about how the men were suffering from terrible things like trench foot and malnutrition and a lot of them, as you probably know, were sort of covered with lice a lot of the time and it was a terribly um, unpleasant, traumatic place to be. A lot of other war poetry tends to possibly glorify war a little bit, you know, we're fighting for king and country. Those of you who are hot on your World War One history as well, will know that a lot of young boys lied about their age. They pretended they were older than they were, so they could go and fight. So people wanted to go and fight, and it was seen as a kind of glorious, heroic thing to do. Wilfred Owen's poetry shows the flip side of that. It's not glorious. It's not heroic in the kind of way that we think of he heroes with shining brass buttons on their uniforms. It's heroic in a much more sort of deep and somber kind of way, but we'll get on to that. Uh, terribly tragically for Wilfred Owen, you know when World War One finished, right? The 11th of November, 1918. Wilfred Owen tragically was killed on the 4th of November, 1918. So this poor man, how old would he have been? 25? Just a week before the war ended, he was killed. It's just a really horrifically tragic end to a very young man's life, and tragically just one of thousands of people who, who died. So, <laughs> happy Tuesday. <laughs> Uh, let's
let's talk a little bit about what shell shock is because that is the theme of this poem. Now there's a couple of pictures here on the screen of soldiers being treated for shell shock. Um, this, I don't know if you can see, this, this chap here with his kind of glazed, kind of fixed grin, staring eyes. Shell shock today, we would call it PTSD, post traumatic stress disorder. And these days, in the 21st century, shell shock is recognised, or rather PTSD is recognised as an, a serious um, mental health problem that soldiers and people in other professions where they, where they see and experience traumatic events like police officers, uh, firefighters, um, lots of these people, um, journalists actually as well, people who are reporting from the front lines of, of conflict. Um, at the moment lots of doctors in the NHS and nurses are suffering from it as well with um, the extent of the coronavirus um, illness that's, uh, that's spreading through the population at the moment. However, a hundred years ago, PTSD wasn't a recognised thing and it was called shell shock. Um, and they believed it was a result of physical injury to the nerves and being exposed to heavy bombardment bombs and bullets flying at you all the time and you can imagine if you are exposed to that 24 hours a day seven days a week for months at a time seeing your fellow soldiers your friends your comrades getting literally getting blown up in front of you and arms and legs coming off and people dying and being in the trenches and not being able to bury people and having to have the dead bodies of your friends piled up until such time as you can, you know, there's a break in the, in the firing and then you can go and bury them. Cannot possibly comprehend the horrors these men went through. And so that is why they suffered mentally from shell shock and like I just said, Wilfred Owen was diagnosed with shell shock and sent to hospital to try and recover. So shell shock victims couldn't eat or sleep. They also had physical symptoms, hysteria and anxiety, paralysis, not being able to move from fear, limping and muscle contractions, blindness and deafness, so sort of your senses shutting down. I think if I saw something terribly traumatic, I would probably want to, to block it out. You know when you're watching something on TV and it's just, oh, and you put your hands in front of your face or put your hands over your ears because you don't want to hear it, la 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 la. It, it's that, isn't it? But it's sort of your body deciding to make yourself blind or deaf so that you don't have to deal with it. Nightmares and insomnia. Insomnia means not being able to sleep heart palpitations, depression, dizziness and disorientation, loss of appetite, and many soldiers found themselves reliving their experiences of combat long after the war had ended. So 1918 was when the war ended, but actually this PTSD, this shell shock, this traumatic um, uh, event that these men had seen, the memories of that replayed in their minds again and again and again. As you know, as you can imagine, it's understandable, isn't it? Uh, there is some evidence to suggest that officers, so the higher ranking people, um, had some of the worst symptoms because they were called upon to repress their emotions, to set an example for their men. Um, it would be like you guys coming into the classroom and seeing the teacher just having a freak out and a meltdown about the exams, then you'd all go, oh, well, we then we'll have a meltdown as well. It's like the officers, the teacher has to be calm and set an example. So, and if you repress your emotions, that's, that's not good for you, is it? Okay, so let's read this poem. I hope you can see that. Uh, it's quite a bit longer than, than the couple of stanzas we read last time, but it is only three stanzas long. Uh, and at the end of each stanza, I'm just going to pause and just go over a little bit about what I think that particular 
stanza is about. So today, all I want to do is get you guys thinking about the meaning um, contained in this poem. And on um, Friday, for show my homework, um, I'm going to set a few sort of comprehension questions which you can expand on as much as you like. Right, here we go. Who are these? Why sit they here in twilight? Wherefore rock they, purgatorial shadows, drooping tongues from jaws that slob their relish, bearing teeth that leer like skulls, tongues wicked, stroke on stroke of pain. But what slow panic gouged these chasms round their fretted sockets, ever from their hair and through their hand palms misery swelters. Surely we have perished sleeping and walk hell, but who these hellish? So this first stanza describes what these men look like physically. So the imagery here of what they look like is really grotesque. I would suggest that it sounds a bit like skeletons or zombies. Chasms round their fretted sockets. So that's obviously their eye sockets. And a, a chasm is like a like a deep gorge, isn't it? Like a valley. So it's as if they've got big dark circles around their eyes, which you would have if you hadn't slept. Um, their tongues are drooping from their jaws that slob and bare their teeth. So they're like, <laughs> they're sort of, they've gone sort of slack jawed and they're just drooling and their tongues are hanging out. Uh, kind of, they kind of look like the walking dead, like zombies. And from their hair and their hands, they're just constantly sweltering um, misery. It's like they're sweating depression it's like oozing out of every pore and then this last line last couple of lines surely we have perished sleeping we must have died in our sleep and walk hell we and we must be in hell but who these hellish who are these hellish people they're suffering so much it's like they're in hell so starts off <laughs> really unpleasantly actually doesn't it um but understandably this is this is how these these men are uh suffering with their post-traumatic stress disorder or their shell shock these are men whose minds the dead have ravished memory fingers in their hair of murders multitudinous murders they once witnessed wading sloughs of flesh these helpless wander, treading blood from lungs that had loved laughter. Always they must see these things and hear them. Batter of guns and shatter of flying muscles, carnage incomparable and human squander rucked too thick for these men's extrication. So the first part of that stanza talks about what the men have seen and heard and witnessed and for these men the soldiers they feel guilty don't they and they feel like they've committed murder rather than going out and killing the enemy in battle in an honorable way it says here um memory fingers in the hair of murders multitudinous murders so not just one or two murders but hundreds thousands multitudinous lots and lots and lots so they've seen and committed murder it is quite an unnatural thing to do isn't it if you think about battle and war to send someone off right you're gonna have six weeks training and then off you go here's your gun shoot all those people and you just have to go and kill people and in world war one it was quite close range with your guns these days you're in tanks or aeroplanes you don't you know the enemy you don't even see the human beings a lot of the time this was you know you saw the expression on, on that soldier's face when you shot him and killed him so that's quite a horrible thing to force someone to do so they are constantly reminded of this um, and then this this kind of sort of second part 
the description of the battlefield is really disgusting and deliberately shocking. Um, so it says here that they waded through sloughs of flesh. So when they're walking through the trenches or across the battlefield, they're like walking through f the flesh of dead people, you know, scattered limbs or whatever, and treading blood from lungs that had loved laughter. So you can imagine these dead soldiers lying there and the soldiers who are alive are having to sort of crawl over them or walk over them because there's no other way to go. And as they squish on, on their lungs, instead of laughter coming out, <laughs> which happened when they were alive, you know, it's, it's blood coming out because, because they're dead. It's, it's disgusting. It really is disgusting and shocking. So this is completely sort of the flip side of heroic, you know, glorified battle and fighting for king and country this is this is out, as real as it gets okay this is um you know no holds barred he's telling it like it is maybe to try and get it across to you the reader get you to understand why these men look like zombies why they're sitting and rocking with staring eyes because of the horrors that they've witnessed all right, last stanza. Therefore, still their eyeballs shrink tormented back into their brains, because on their sense, sunlight seems a blood smear. Night comes blood black. Dawn breaks open like a wound that bleeds afresh. Thus, their heads wear this hilarious, hideous, awful falseness of set smiling corpses. Thus, their hands are plucking at each other, picking at the rope knouts of their scourging, snatching after us who smote them, brother, pouring us who dealt them war and madness. So the first stanza starts off by saying, why are these men sitting here rocking backs and forwards looking like zombies? The second stanza is telling us this is what they have seen, this is what they have witnessed. The third stanza says, therefore, which means this is why. Okay, because of that, this is why. They are constantly remembering the horrors of their experience. They can't escape it. Because of this, their experience, this is why their eyeballs shrink, tormented back into their brains. And Sunlight is like a blood smear across the sky. And when night comes, it's blood black. And when it's dawn, it's like a wound breaking open and bleeding again. So at every time of the day, daytime, nighttime, dawn, sunset, whenever, they close their eyes and all they see is blood and horror. Um, and on their heads, they've got this hilarious, hideous, awful, set smiling corpses. They're just sort of grinning inanely and doing this plucking their hands at each other and what about the final couple of lines here they're snatching after us who smote them brother pouring us who dealt them war and madness so are these men suffering because of something they chose to do did they choose this no us we dealt them war and madness is us. It was the government, the war, who sent the men out. So whose fault is it that these men are in this state? Our fault. It's the government's fault. It's um, the country's fault. Okay. Quite an intense poem there with quite a lot of um, really unpleasant imagery. Uh, your task today is to do a little bit of research, please. Um, this is the question I would like you to answer. Now, there is no wrong answer. Hooray for English literature. No wrong answer. Um, it's poetry. It's up to you to decide. Um, the poet here has presented you with an image, with an idea, with his perspective. Um, but it's up to you what you take from that. So this is my question. These shell-shocked soldiers, these men, should we call them brave soldiers? Should they come back with medals, you know, for honour and valour and courage and bravery? Are they brave? 
or have they somehow failed in their duty? So what I'd like you to do is um, do two boxes like this. So on the one side, whoops, I want you to do a little bit of research. Sorry, I don't know if you heard that, I just stubbed my toe. <laughs> I want you to do a bit of research on how the British government wanted us to view the war. So you might want to see what you can find um, online, um, maybe talk to your parents or relatives, they might have um, some knowledge of this from when they were at school. Um, some propaganda, some posters. How did the British government want the public, the British public, to view the war? Okay, and then on the other side, how is this different to the actual experience of the men who went into battle? There's loads of stuff online. Um, the First World War, loads of men kept diaries. As I say, there's lots and lots of war poetry um, that talks about the experience of the men. So, on the one hand, how did they want us to view the war? And how is this different to the actual experience? So we're looking at sort of kind of the glory of war versus the reality of war. I hope that makes sense. I would like you to send that through to me, but you can send it all through on Friday um, when I'm going to give you a, a few more questions on this poem. You can just send it all through then if that's okay. Any questions? please do um, drop me a message, email me. Um, I really enjoy um, getting emails with your general comments and feedback. Um, thank you very much to those who emailed last week with some thoughts on the poetry. Really glad to see you're engaging with it. Um, and I will speak to you soon. Take care. Bye-bye.